Jamaica might have discovered oil, and in today's video, I'm going to discuss the oil discovery, what that might mean for Jamaica, pros and cons, and I'm also going to be doing a giveaway, so stay tuned. I just got that money swag. First things first, let's do some housekeeping. Um, in today's video, I'm wearing a watch. Um, this is a Marobe watch. This watch company is founded by a African-American, um, went to an HBCU alum, good friend of mine, and there's a link below uh, to purchase this watch. You're seeing the video. Um, if you enjoyed it, this video, please you know, check out his watch company. He's doing big things. Um, so now that that's done, Let's talk about this giveaway that I'm doing. I think you guys will be very excited to know that I'm giving away a home biogas system. I'm really excited about the giveaway that I'm doing today. In today's giveaway, I'm going to be giving away a home biogas system, specifically the number two system. So the home biogas company has residential up to commercial size capacity so it could fit whatever needs that you had i'm giving out the most basic system that they have and my system also if you look up their website it, this one is going to include the toilet because hopefully the winter would be open to me coming out there and helping them set it up and i didn't want to set up an outhouse system if i've never done that before for my first giveaway and really push my handy skills understanding that what goes on when you use an outhouse, if that makes sense. So I'm really excited about the giveaway. You're gonna see a video about what exactly I'm giving away right now. Hi guys, my name is Michael, and I'm here with the new generation home biogas system that turns your organic waste into renewable energy. I'll show you how it works, and I'll tell you everything you'll get out of it. Let's jump right in. This is where you pour the organic waste. The system takes any kind of organic material, vegetables, fruit, and even meat and dairy, unlike composters. The waste goes down here into the digester where bacteria break it down to biogas. Once created, the gas goes up here into the filter, then down this pipe to the gas bag. The gas flows through this pipe to the kitchen stove. This is the stove that comes with every home biogas system. The flame you see here was created by my organic waste. The system creates up to two hours worth of cooking time every day. And of course, it's 100% renewable energy. Now let's head back out to the garden where I'll show you the second awesome byproduct of the system. Follow me. See this amazing vegetable garden? This liquid fertilizer created by the home biogas system nourished it and helped it grow to be this beautiful. I want to tell you about the upgraded features of the new generation of home biogas. In the new version, we unified the fertilizer outlet and the gas filter. It's much more efficient and is much easier to assemble. Also, the whole system is made of extremely durable material that has a lifespan of 15 years. We made it all black to absorb as much sunlight as possible so that the bacteria are more productive. We're also proud to say that the material is 100% recyclable. Here you can see our off-grid patent. The unique design of sandbags placed on top of the gas bag to create pressure for the gas to flow into the kitchen. For initial activation, bacteria is put in once into the system by using cow or horse manure from your local farm. It's an entirely closed system. There's no smell, so no way it will attract animals. Now let's talk about how to make the bacteria happy by finding the best place for the system to maximize your gas output. Make sure you pick a sunny location, a flat level surface. It's important that you have easy access both to the inlet and to the outlet because accessing them will be a part of your daily routine. So that's the basics of how the home biogas system works. I hope I got you as excited as I am about converting your waste into cooking gas and fertilizer for your garden. Join the home biogas family today. See you soon. Now that you're back, let me tell you about how you could win. So it's simple and it's gonna be free to you. I'll ship it out to you. Subscribe, 
comment and join my YouTube channel um, membership program. And if you're a subscriber, you left a comment and are a member of the membership program 30 days from the release of this video. Um, so if I release it October 20th, 30 days from October 20th, I'll make the announcement and then I'll get your information to figure out how to ship it to you. Um, I am just passionate about the environment. So that's why I want to give away a home biogas 2 system. Um, if you don't win and you're in the islands, there's also going to be a link below to gather your information so I can forward it to the forwarder for um, the distributor for the Caribbean. Um, so if you're interested in purchasing it and you live in the Caribbean, um, just click the link that's going to be below and you'll get connected to, and I'll connect you to the person directly. Um, the distribution for the Caribbean just um, got handed out. So uh, still needs to do some getting off the ground, but we'll be able to hook you up with a system in the Caribbean. You'll probably hear them refer to more as the carbon eater systems, and it's gonna be the same thing, but they're just calling the carbon eater system for it to be more easily digested into that market. So you might hear me refer to it as either the home biogas two system or the carbon eater system. Um, but if you're interested in purchasing one in the Caribbean, link below. I was actually trying to give it to the woman who asked uh, Prime Minister Holness for the donkey, but I couldn't get in contact with her. That's what I wanted to give it to, but I, I, I just couldn't figure out her information and get to her. Cause I'm like, I think this would be perfect, especially for somebody who's like living on a farm. So if you're interested, um, you want it for your granddad who lives on a farm or you want it just to get off the grid. Those are the three things that you gotta do. Um, and that's it. So I'm really excited about this giveaway. Um, you can go from residential to commercial and I hope to be able to do this all the time. So the bigger that the channel gets, the more subscribers, more members that I get, the more giveaways I'll do, the more frequent I'll do this. So if this one does well, I plan to do one in another year. If it does really well, six months, does exceptionally well, quarterly, and so on and so forth. So if you think this is a cool idea and you didn't win this time, that doesn't mean you don't have a chance to win, that it's just this time. So those are the stipulations for right now. Sign up, sign up for the membership, subscribe, leave a comment, and it could be yours. <laughs>
but it doesn't mean we can't make good money because we're looking at about 12%, like one out of 10 or 10 out of every 100 or 12 out of every 100 barrels would be for Jamaica. I'm probably gonna use the number 10 to make it easier, but just know that that number's gonna be a little bit higher. So if Guyana got, we have 80% of what Guyana got. Guyana, if they have 250,000 barrels of oil and they made a billy, we're probably looking at 800,000. Uh, not 800,000, 800 million dollars. That'd be crazy. So we're looking at 800 million dollars. So um, at 50,000, we're looking at probably looking at 160 million dollars or so. Jamaica's probably looking at, um, which is pretty good, 150, 160. So in year three, I bring it. Where, where are the 250 coming from? Year three production, Guyana last year made 250,000 barrels. It took, they made the discovery in the t mid 20 teens and it took them until last year to be producing 250,000 barrels. So I think in about 2028 or so will be, you're seeing the numbers right here. This is where I think we'll be. So 50,000 barrels, I think that's low, but it's a good number to talk about. So at 50,000 barrels and we'll probably start making the oil three, the five years after um, next year, once they make the oil discovery, announce the oil discovery, um, we're looking at in 2028 or so making $150 million, $160 million added to the Jamaican economy. That's, that's good money. That's great money. So let's talk about, and that's in the short term right then, shot to the economy. And I think Jamaica could use that. Definitely Jamaica could use that. Let's talk about long-term wealth though. So let's look at the numbers for Trinidad. Trinidad has a GDP of about $28 billion. And Jamaica has a GDP of about $17 billion. So Jamaica's GDP is about 60% of what Trinidad's is. So the countries are different. But what I want to bring attention to is, um, and why I wanted to talk about long-term wealth, is for my calculations, what I, what I was able to find is that the oil and gas sector adds about 40% of Trinidad's GDP. So the difference between our economy and their economy could be attributed to the oil sector. So if we can get into a situation where our oil production... Uh, contributes the same amount, that would be amazing. But if we look at the amount of barrels that Trinidad sold, Trinidad sold, the amount of oil that they sold is only going to be about $1 or $2 billion. But we're looking at, at almost $10.4 billion added to the economy. How does that happen? They were able to integrate the oil into a sector and develop the economy around that and not just sell oil. So pro long-term wealth, we have to sell oil and we have to develop the economy around the oil. So refining products, things of that nature. We can't just sell the oil. There's just not as much money in it as we can get from selling the products. Like you're gonna make less money being a player than you are going to be an owner and players go broke. You don't hear about too many owners going broke. So take some ownership of the oil sector. We can really turn this into a wealth haven because you can have income, but it's not what you make, it's what you keep. And that's what's the difference between a rich person, rich athlete that goes broke, and a wealthy family that's been wealthy for generations. So let's talk about another thing that I definitely don't want to get lost in translation, lost in the discussion, and that's cost savings. So if we look at these 2021 numbers, Jamaica imported about 8.2 million barrels of oil, which is about 22 and a half thousand every day barrels. Um, and that was 580, let's call it $581 million US money. So that average price is like $70 a barrel. So that $70 is a barrel a number was important because Jamaica's oil is projected to be profitable at $40 a barrel. So they would still be making profit at $40. 
So I would like, and hopefully I'll save that for the discussion at the end, but Jamaica, if they can work out a deal where they purchase it, not at cost, at profit, just a slight profit and not that much oil, 22 and a half thousand barrels isn't that much at cost. At, now, I wouldn't call it cost, at profit. That $40 times the 8.2 million barrels is $328 million. So you m subtract that number from the $581 million. And Jamaica saves $253 million. Let's just take off that three because I rounded up a little bit. Jamaica saves $250 million that year. Keep that $250 million cost savings at the end because I'm going to discuss, you know, how Jamaica may be able to potentially reduce taxes or eliminate taxes based on the money that they would be making and saving. So add this $250 million number to the numbers that I talk you on at the end. But I think that Jamaica could do well just by cutting the cost of how much it costs to import the oil. It's going to get cheaper. You know, potentially we can get more oil. It's going to be very good. And 250, that's almost half of, the, that's a lot of money that's freed up in the economy. So I think Jamaica could benefit a lot simply by cost savings. And I didn't get into the refined products because I don't know exactly. I wasn't able to find exactly the percentage of what we refined, et cetera, et cetera. But 22,000 barrels of crude at that price, you know, um, that's less than the capacity of petrol dram. And we can ask the politicians, what are you doing? Are you making sure that Jamaica gets the first section of this oil? Because even if we buy the 23,000 barrels or so, that would equals in a day, if there's only 50,000 barrels, they still have all that profit. And if you see the other countries around us, if they're making the average number is like 400,000 or so barrels a day, 400 to 500,000 barrels. So that's 10 X that number. So we're, we're buying what 5% of all the oil that comes out. They're still making buku money. We're saving all this money and we're still splitting in the profit. We're just stacking the benefits on top of each other, man. I think it would be really good for the Island for us to buy the, um, funds. I think it also would be pro lifestyle. And how is that? By not having to import gas, it's going to drive costs down a lot. It also makes it energy intensive industries on the island more attractive. If Jamaica has cheap energy, Jamaica can attract factories, chemical fact factories that take a lot of energy. If we have cheap energy, they'll come here. Goods already expensive to make in Jamaica. If we can bring the cost down, that's going to help out a lot. Um, uh, some of the firms that left the EU during like the natural gas crisis left because it just became too expensive. Now, if Jamaica has cheap fuel, come down to Jamaica. United States, you need to niche, near shore some of that stuff that you're making, come down to Jamaica. Jamaica could also this is also a lifestyle thing. Jamaica could be making so much money, they can abolish income taxes. I think they should abolish them on both, but they can abolish personal and investment income taxes on a person, which gives young persons incentive to work because you get to keep all of your money. You keep people on the island. I, I just think it's going to be good. And I think it's pro-development because the extra funds that Jamaica has and puts in a sovereign wealth fund or saves in um, importing oil costs, they could put that towards, you know, what happens the next time a hurricane comes through. We have $64 million a year that we're saving that we could put into the sovereign wealth fund that we could invest. And when that hurricane comes through, it costs $50 million to rebuild whatever got destroyed. We stole a positive $14 million. You know what I mean? It, it, pro development, the the extra funds the government receives could be used to build infrastructure. Um, you know, asphalt is a byproduct. So if we have all this asphalt, we can make you know the roads better. You know, cheaper roads. There's just so much available once you have that oil money, plastics, et cetera, et cetera. Everything can get a lot cheaper. 
and it, we could develop the island faster if we have cheap oil and you know goods ready to be available that are made from that oil. So this is another one we need to talk about, environment. Let's say, let's say you're looking at this graphic. Let's say Jamaica gets to 350,000 barrels of oil a day. It wouldn't even be a top five producer in the region. Look at this map. You can't even see 350,000 barrels of oil a day on this thing. Jamaica wouldn't even be a top five producer on this map. And this is what we need to tell the politicians, in my, in my opinion. I'm, not, I'm getting emotional, but this is because this is going to be one of the big pushbacks that we're going to hear. Um, Jamaica oil production is going to be a drop in the hat globally. It's just a drop in the hat. You can actually see it. This is actually nothing. The argument that it will lead to increased greenhouse emissions, to me, is overblown. Think about this. Boeing, Airbus, whoever makes these big, big, big purchases for planes. You see this graphic right here. Do you think they're going to buy or produce an extra plane or take an extra trip for if global oil production goes from 90 million barrels a day to 90.3? No. That's not how big business is. No one's making, it's not going to do anything globally except for make it cheaper to buy the oil. There's, it's not going to per, increase the demand for oil. The demand for oil is the demand for oil. It's going to be separate than 0.3. It's not even going up 10%. It's not even going up 1%. It's going up, what, a third of a percent? Like a fourth of a percent, like it's going up, it's, it's, it's going up, this is, that's crazy. It's just, it, it, I've heard that in Guyana and I thought it was crazy there, but for us, it, we have even less oil than them. I don't think Jamaica's oil production is going to matter. And mathematically, I don't think you can have that argument. I kept the graphic up this whole time because I know that argument is gonna come up. Hopefully people can just screenshot it and send it their way, okay. And also the environmental factor that I don't think people are really factoring in is that if climate change is assured, and that's what we're hearing, climate change is assured, Jamaica did not, is not a leading producer to climate change. Jamaica is going to suffer con, uh, effects, excuse me, Jamaica is going to suffer from climate change while simultaneously not being a key contributor to climate change. There is no way we should not develop this oil because we're going to need the money to protect ourselves from the climate change that the West, all these big players, China, whoever, is producing the pollution. We're not even producing the pollution and our little island is going to get all of the brunt of the effects of it. And you're telling us not to get any money to protect us from that. Don't get any money to protect us from more hurricanes. Don't get any money just don't make any money and you just suffer the consequences of our actions. To me, absolutely not. You leave a comment below and let me know how you feel. I just think that, it, that is overblown and completely unfair. Look at this graphic. Jamaica is not up there at all. It's not going to make it. We're not even the top five, not five producers in the world in the region. Come on now. So... Let's talk about Dutch disease. So this is something that we need to talk about. Dutch disease is an economic term for the negative consequences that can arise in a spike in a value nation's currency. So it happened to the Dutch. It's not a, it's not a black thing, white thing, Middle Eastern thing. It's just a thing that happens when you randomly get a lot of resources, your economy gets stuck because there's so much more, your currency gets so much stronger randomly, it makes it hard, makes your exports not effective. So Dutch disease is something that we have to monitor, but I think Dutch disease um, is a good thing. Not a good thing. I think Dutch disease being one of the cons is a good thing because I think Jamaica can overcome Dutch disease. Um, Dutch disease also comes into effect when you're over-reliant on one sector. I think, unlike Guyana, unlike Iraq, unlike Iran, unlike some of these other big oil producers, 
Jamaica has um, a tourist industry, so that is robust. So all the big hotels, all those, there's somebody else fighting against the oil interest that's going to keep the government honest and say, hey, look, don't forget about where your bread was butter all these years. I know you're getting this oil money, but don't forget about us. They're going to fight in the government for favors from the government. And them two fighting with each other is going to keep, help keep the economy in balance, which you don't have in some of those Middle Eastern countries where nobody really wants to go. So I think Dutch disease is going to be an issue, but I don't think it's going to be the issue that people are making it out to be. So also a con is that you are in control of your own destiny. So this could be a pro or a con, depending on who you are. I think governments tend to be heavy. I think we got, I think Minister Nigel Clark, I think he's a good dude. I think he's doing good things. I think if we got oil right now, the people in charge would be good people to manage that. But let's talk about it. So oil doesn't equal success. Look at Venezuela. They are the number one oil reserve haver in the world. Don't want to live there. Economy is worse than Jamaica. And it is not a good place economically for people to live. Economic chaos. Nigeria has had oil for decades. And they just this year got a facility to produce enough refined product for their people. So oil does not equal success. Oil does not equal success. You have to develop the oil and you have to develop refined products. If you don't have refined products, you end up like Nigeria. If you nationalize the oil system or something like that, if it's not a well-run system, you get Venezuela. So those are two cautionary tales that you don't necessarily get oil and get money. You have to develop the oil and you have to, we, this is something we all have to fight on. We have to do refined products. You can't just sell crude. There's no, there's really no money in it. So I think Dutch disease will pass us by because we have the tourism. We have other sectors to fight back where Nigeria, Venezuela had some actually, but uh, Guyana is not as big of a tourist destination as us. Iraq, Iran, whoever you want to say who produces this oil, people don't really want to go there. So they don't have, all they have is the oil. They don't have anyone else to fight. That's something we have to worry about in our economy and the Jamaican dollar being real strong hurting our exports. That's something, that's something real we have to worry about. That's a real con to the, discovering this oil. So let's talk about peak oil. Peak oil is when all the electric cars, everything comes online. Um, we'll reach a point inevitably where nobody needs oil anymore for gas and the oil demand will go down and then the peak will be the highest point. I don't think we reach this peak. Um, and then from that peak, everything, the demand will go down from there. I don't think we reach the peak. I don't think we're close to the peak. I don't think we reach the peak one because um, all these undeveloped nations, the easiest way to develop a nation is with hydrocarbons, is with gas, oil. It's just easier than solar panels, nuclear power, and things of that nature. I don't think that's something we have to worry about. I also think peak oil is going to work similar to peak cigarettes. People still smoke, people still consume tobacco. Yeah, it's not at, that at its peak, but you can still make a lot of money owning, you know, Altria stock or British American tobacco stock. I think oil is going to be in 50 years, 60 years, it'll probably be something similar to tobacco where yes, it's not at its peak, but you can get plenty rich um, selling tobacco, selling cigarettes, selling whatever, even if it has a dirty name, dirty connotation to it, because people still need it, people still don't use it. Electric cars are getting more popular, but we're still far away from electric planes and electric boats, and that's where most of the carbon is getting produced. So I don't think peak oil is something we have to worry about. And then to me, peak oil is not a reason not to sell oil today, because if we hit peak oil in 2020, not 2020, 2060, 2070. So you miss out on all that time making money to me. Doesn't make sense. Okay. And then this is something that we have to worry about. Um, a buyer's OPEC. So with the Russian situation, we've seen the capacity for countries to come in and set a price of oil 
that they're not willing to pay above. So could buyers come together and you have OPEC, which is the cartel that says, we're gonna produce this much, we're going to produce above. Nigeria is a member of OPEC. Um, they aren't, they are just getting oil production in their country to meet their domestic demand this year. So for people who want to join OPEC, it's not a, you know, instant success card. Just had to put that in there. Um, so if we have a buyer's OPEC, which would be a buyer's cartel, and they just come together, United States, Australia, whoever comes together, we're not paying over $60 a barrel. And then it's either you produce and sell at $60 a barrel or you don't sell anything. That's something that we have to worry about. Do I see that coming? No, um, because the United States is a major buyer of oil and producer. So they would be shooting themselves in the foot and they would be shooting the demand for dollars in the foot, which would hurt the, the dollar in a way because it would reduce the demand for dollars. So I don't think that's on the horizon, but that could happen one day. They say, you know what? I'm not paying more than $80 a barrel. If you can't sell it to me, uh, well, we'll just put up more uh, electric car stations, electric boats, whatever. That's something that we have to worry about. So I'm going to pause the video right now and I'm going to get into what I think we should do with the oil. And if you're interested, I asked Dr. Umar Johnson what he thought we should do with the oil. And that link is in the description box below. I'm in one of my vacant apartments. I don't have a prompter. Some of these numbers are a little bit complex. So just bear with me a little bit on this. And I apologize for that. But this is just my section. You watch this whole video. You might as well watch it to the end. This is what I would do if I was king. Um, the, my, Dr. Umar, in the link below, he left his thoughts on the topic. So um, first thing I would do is I would build a facility to help offset what the petrodam is going to have to be taken on because if we have 36 billion 36,000 barrels a day facility i say we increase that facility i don't know if we could shut it down or how that would work either sh increase that one or build a new one um i think we should build a new one anyway build it in a part of the island where people need jobs um and of course strategically located so balance that between the two so you get a facility, the Dangote facility, I think it was like $18 billion. If we build, and now 650,000 barrels, if we build a facility for 65,000 barrels, um, because you make all the money selling crude, and I really want this to work, um, especially my family worked in the crude space, and it's just like, it would be nice to see this really work out. So we build a 65,000 facility, 65,000 barrel facility, and let's say it costs two to three billion dollars to build it i think we start doing that today or the day they make, make the announcement that um start building that now so that way when the oil capacity is ready they could just ship it to where it needs to go take out a loan and just say this loan maybe gets preferential treatment um that's what i would do and then the second thing i would do is i would um this is something that i would really like to see buy-in um, I think it's possible because they're raising the tax threshold to 3 million Jamaican right now. Um, I look at it like this. You're seeing graphics come across your screen. Jamaica has a tax rate that is higher than somebody who lives in Miami and almost the same as somebody who lives in London. Um, there's a lot of Jamaicans in Philly, so I put PA on there. Um, taxes are a fee that we pay to be a part of society, right? That's, that's what we do it for. We use taxes as a fee to be a part of society. So I don't think you're, you could tell me, and part of society is educating your children and your children being able to get a job and take care of themselves and do all that stuff. I don't think you could say that Jamaica is the superior place to raise a kid versus Miami. I don't think you could say that in terms of all the benefits that you would get from living in America. And I don't think it's comparable with the city of London. So I think the taxes in Jamaica are already too high if we're using taxes as a fee to be a part of society. Not to say that these places have a superior society. I just think a big part of the reason why we organize, us, organize ourselves in a society is 
to better educate our youth and, you know, for the children. And I don't think you could say like 100% of the time that your kids have a better opportunity growing up in uh, Jamaica than they do at growing up in London or growing up in Miami. Because um, the taxes are almost like 40, to what, 40, 50% more than Miami. You can't tell me Jamaica is a 50% better place to raise a child than Miami. So the taxes, I think, off the top have to come down. But with them raising the tax threshold, I think we should be able to remove taxes altogether. So this is why these numbers are really high. Um, and I wanted to make sure I got them right. So projections for 2022, 2023 um, for income taxes, for taxes on interest and dividends is $23 million Jamaican. $23 billion Jamaican. So for those of us in America, we're looking at $153 million. So in that year three, we could use that money to offset the income that people are paying on taxes and interest in Jamaica. And that would just be step one of my plan because I don't want this money to go to the government. And you can like the JLP, you cannot like the JLP, you can like third party, you can like whoever you like. I think Minister Nigel Clark might be one of my favorite people in a political position in the world right now. I think he's doing a good job and I think he would be a good steward of this capital. But I just don't think that we should give the money to the government. I think the money should go to the regular person. Um, and first, the first, the cheapest thing would be get rid of the taxes on interest and dividends. You increase investment into the island and it happens slowly. We don't have the government or whoever's in the government making the, all the decisions all at one time. It happens slowly as everybody has, it increases the opportunities for investment because you don't want foreign direct investment. You want foreign portfolio investment because foreign direct investment means if they build a factory in Jamaica, they could just move it if labor gets too high. Foreign, foreign portfolio investment means they took that money and put it into a Jamaican company and that company is not going anywhere. So even if they sell their stock, that company is still in Jamaica no matter what. That's what we want. And we don't want the taxes to be on investing and interest and the little bit of interest that people get in their bank accounts. We want it to be as easy as possible for companies to invest in Jamaica, not bring investments to Jamaica, invest in Jamaica. So I think we should get rid of this tax. And then if a couple of rich people make out it, so what? I think it would be better for Jamaica as a whole if we just got rid of that tax. And then I think we can get rid of all of income taxes after that. All of income taxes are, were projected for 22, 23. I won't do all of income. So this would be income tax on a person. It's going to be 77 billion. I'll, I'll round it up to 78 billion. 78 billion or 520 million dollars Jamaican. So if we get to that 250,000 barrels or so that Guyana had, boom, that's enough to pay that. And that's enough to pay both of them together because we got 800 million. Those two numbers, let's see, that's 674 million dollars. We get to that 250,000 barrel number, that's, that's enough for the interest to take away the taxes on investing because we want people to invest in Jamaica and we get rid of the income tax on people and this would be good because that means the average everyday person gets all of their paycheck, right? And, and instead of the government being able to make out, because you're going to get the same amount of money as you were getting before, instead of the government taking it and wasting it, instead of the government taking it and putting it where they think it needs to be put best, we can still slowly but surely put this money into the economy and Jamaicans who actually live in Jamaica and, and have to deal with the consequences of where this money goes, get to choose where that money goes. Every week you get a little bit and it enters the economy slowly. So you don't have to worry about inflation as much because the, the money is entering the economy slowly every paycheck. Every paycheck, a little bit of money comes into the economy. The economy can handle it. The, the tourists, when they come down, they'll stay the same. But like the average person is putting their little bit of money every time that they come down and spend. 
And this is great because after 600, so that's $670 million, $674 million. So we get to that 250,000 barrel number, they still net $126 million. And we looked at the competitors uh, or, comp or the comps, I will call them, and they are uh, companies, uh, countries, and they're doing like 400, 500,000 barrels of oil a day. So this is at 250, so like twice that. So the, the government is still making their money. They're still gonna get taxed from consumption tax, but the regular everyday person gets all of their money. That would be one of the biggest things I would like to see. Cause I would like first, you know, you build a refinery so we can make more money off the refined goods. You take the profit from the, the oil monies. By year three, no taxes on investments. By, by was that year 10, year eight, we have no taxes on people and the money gets to enter the economy slowly. The, and that way the politicians don't get to spend the money till we get used to having some money. You don't wanna give the government all that money at one time, they get $156 million. Absolutely not. And then they just blow it all that one year. They get more money by producing for us. If they make it, if you make it a good place to invest, they make it a good place to live, good place to work, we'll spend our money more. It gives the onus on where that money goes and the control into us. So. For me, I want to see us increase the capacity, no taxes, and then I would like for Jamaica to then build the sovereign wealth fund with the extra money. Let's get the average person living right, and then we'll deal with everything else. And I also want to get rid of the taxes because think about this: if you have a salary, and I'm going to use a hundred thousand or a hundred hundred thousand dollars U.S is $115 million Jamaican. So if somebody's making 15 million good job at the oil company, like they making a good, good wage, are they gonna leave if you keep your whole check? Cause like if you go to the United States to make 100,000, I mean, you're gonna take home probably 10 million, 10 million Jamaican, probably that's what you're gonna take home. 10, eight to 10 million we're gonna take home depending on where you live. But if you live in Jamaica, you get that whole 15, you're probably gonna stay. And it works the other way around. If, so, if a company is gonna offer you 12 million in Jamaica and you 15 million in, Jama in the United States, but you're making 10 million now, you gotta go. But if that 15 million is actually gonna be like 10, 11, 12 million after taxes, you're probably gonna stay. You're not gonna probably uproot your whole life, be away from your mom and your daddy for a million, maybe two million. It changes. Some people will still do that because they always want to live in America, but it makes Jamaica more competitive as well for the jobs that are going to be developed in Jamaica. You don't have to pay as high as a wage because it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. Like I said in the beginning, if we make it so people keep more money, you don't have to pay them as much and it makes it more competitive to work in Jamaica. It makes it more competitive. We stop the brain drain by allowing people to keep more of their money. So those are the things I think we should do. Sovereign Wealth Fund after that. Let's take care of the people first and we can figure out everything else after that. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure that you like and subscribe normally. If you're interested in winning, like, subscribe, you know, sign up for my YouTube uh, account, um, the, the subscription account, and then leave a comment. And then 30 days from now, I'll announce the winner. And, um, yeah, I just really, before I go, I just really think Jamaica will do well with this money if we just stay focused on what's going on and just understand that it would be better to keep the money in the hands of the people as much as we can. And governments don't do well with money, typically. Do have some exceptions, but to keep the money in the hands of the people, I think is the best thing. Improve the lives of the people. This should be for the people. 150,000% I feel that way. So this is Nick signing out. Thanks for watching.